Shall I get Erin? Yes, please. Okay, we're good to go. Cool. I'm going to go then. Oh, it's over now. Um, so everyone, welcome to our virtual Open IFTAR 2021. Thank you for joining us today on Zoom, Facebook, and I think YouTube as well. So my name is Rohan, and I'll be your host this evening. Um, the last time I hosted was this time last year, so do bear with me if I'm a little rusty. Um, we have an exciting event planned this evening with Dr. Craig Considine um, here. He is a, um, but yeah, so but first I'd like to thank, I'll introduce Craig more formally later on. But first, I'd like to thank our media partner for this year, Islam Channel, and give a special welcome to those joining us from Islam Channel's Facebook and YouTube. It is a pleasure to have you with us all today. I also wanted to thank the Arts Council UK, whose help has allowed us to continue our work this Ramadan, all of which is available on our website. This includes our virtual open iftars every night of Ramadan, our Ramadan late course for the first 18 years of Ramadan, and our My Open Iftar Packs for 2021. This year's packs not only help you to bring the Ramadan spirit into your home, but in collaboration with Islamic Relief, our charity partner, with each pack bought, you'll be feeding a person in need for a whole month. You can check out the incredible work Islamic Relief does at iruk.co.uk for slash RTP. Our virtual open iftars are interactive, so I'd like to encourage everyone to hop into the Zoom meeting. And for those of you who are comfortable to turn your cameras on so we can see you, um, it's always great to see loads of people all together. Um, we'll begin with a quick run through of the text. So you'll find at the bottom of the screens, um, there's a reaction on Zoom. So for those on Zoom, and you can show us how you're feeling in real time. I believe there's like a thumbs up um, a wave. There's also a raise, raise hand option for you if you want to ask a speaker a question or add to the discussion. Um, and then someone will be able to unmute you. And you can also, of course, do it on the chat as well. And Feel free to converse in the chat and meet each other. This is all about bringing people together and and learning about, and meeting new people, uh, even if it's virtually. So our first, so our speaker today is Dr. Craig Considine, Considine, um, who is a scholar, global speaker, media contributor, and public intellectual based at the Department of Sociology at Rice University. He's author of many books and articles. And his opinions have appeared in various publications, such as the New York Times, Washington Post, I know CNN, BBC, um, and even Foreign Policy, which is one of my favorite magazines. Um, he has been invited to speak at some of the leading international organizations and universities in the world, um, and is quite visible on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, and he said that he needs to get back into that. He's been in the conversation before, so we'll be looking forward to seeing what he says. Um, uh, he holds a PhD from Trinity College University of Dublin, um, a master's from Royal Holiday University of London, and a BA from American University in Washington, DC. Um, Dr. Constantine is a US Catholic of Irish and Italian descent, and he was telling us a little bit about his background before we came live. Um, and I think the one thing that I'm really interested about is his work on interface relations and all his studies and academic on that. So I think that's, I think that's the most relevant for us here, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And feel free to ask any questions you have, you have on that topic. Um, but before we get into that specifically, um, it's talk, uh, how about we have a quick poll? So how is everyone who's been fasting, how has your fast feel today? Um, and I can, so it's launched now, so feel free to answer the questions. Um, and while we have the, while we have people entering their polls. Uh, how about we talk to some other people in the group? So uh, let's go. So Shabana, how are you feeling today? And how's, how's your fast today? Asalaamu Alaikum. Um, I'm feeling okay actually today. Um, it was actually quite warm today. So I actually went for a long walk and it's nice to get out, but um, obviously it's, it is harder when you come out in the sunshine and you can't obviously drink anything but yeah alhamdulillah fasting's going well it's been obviously getting towards a week now so getting into a routine of um kind of what you have to do I suppose but yeah looking forward to iftar today definitely for sure just to have a nice a cold glass of water yeah definitely it's been quite warm today actually I was I was only outside a little bit in the morning but because uh, I was in San but yeah it's been quite warm it's good weather I don't know 
I don't know whether I prefer it to be warm or cool during Ramadan because I mean I like good weather but I don't want if it gets too warm then I might get too thirsty and might just hurt my fast I don't know how you feel about that if it's too cold it's not good either I feel like this year's harder than last year last year was warmer but I feel like this year is definitely colder at the moment so you can't have any hot drinks and it sounds really crazy <laughs> but you can't even have um any warm drinks or anything so yeah I don't know it's every every Ramzan has its challenges every year yeah true um and let's see who else is so I'm just ending actually give a f- another minute or so for the poll because I think some people still want to answer um but how about we go to how how are Zine? How's Zine? How's your fast go today? Hey, hi, salam everyone. Okay. It's going okay. Actually, I'm enjoying my Sunday. I'm trying to trying to bake and cook a little bit more because I still I have time more than the weekend. So typically, I was trying to do um, uh, banana banana bread. Yeah, which is quite nice. I like this kind of food. For dessert, that's good. And as well, I've done um, Tunisian uh, samosas. Not sure oh, everyone nice. knows. Yeah, not sure everyone knows the name. It's uh, the name is Brick, and uh, so typically samosas is like a, yeah. So you have uh, something like this, and then you put filling inside, or um, uh, so sometimes we put egg inside, and it's quite big actually. And this one I fry. So usually I I use the oven. Uh, to have them like it's like I feel like it's more healthy but sometimes just to try I just want to remember how mom was doing them I was like yeah I'm gonna try to do the same send her the picture look what I've done is that okay <laughs> kind of things so yeah I've tried to to take this time as well to yeah to to, to do this and um, to listen to Quran as well because it's Ramadan so um, yeah I'm trying to find a balance between uh, like uh, finding like doing nice stuff and as well like uh, having time for spirituality as well during the weekend uh, yeah and it's going so quick it's already almost the end of the weekend gosh yeah i know it goes it actually goes really quickly i kind of i thought um the weekend will go a lot slower than during the week because when i'm not working everything goes over but it seems to go really fast today maybe because i've just been enjoying myself and have loads of stuff to do so <laughs> um but yeah i'm actually really interested in all this tunis and similar stuff have you ever um because I'm also I'm obviously used to Indian and Pakistani samosas as being that's yeah. my background. Um, but have you ever? So I don't know. Have you tr- have you tried making both and compared, or is it have you just kind of stuck to the Tunisian style? For now, it's my Tunisian stuff. Sorry, guys. <laughs> but maybe I'm gonna try at one time the the Indian the Indian samosas. The only thing is like I cannot eat too much spice. Totally. So my yeah, like typically if there's too much spice, I like I could not he- eat it. I know I'm Tunisian, right? So which is quite weird. We used to eat a lot of spice, but yeah, when I'm born in Europe, so <laughs> this can be uh, this can explain the fact that yeah, I like spice, but not too much spice, like too hot, I can handle it. So yeah. No, I can imagine that. That's probably. Um... Yeah, and then I think I forget how I think I forget my spice, my spice ability, like the, how much spice I can take because I'm just. Oh my god! It, oh, I've been I so. You, know what you do guys like seriously, yeah. amazing. I, to be fair, I did have one time. The one time though, I think it was me and my sister. We were had we there was a place nearby back in the day when you can actually go outside and see restaurants um there was a place where we had really good chicken wings and there's like a 10 different spice levels and then when we tried the first one it was like the <laughs> tried the mildest one um and it was it was great but it was like oh we need a bit more spicy and then the next time we went i think it was like a year later we tried like the top spice and we're thinking now nah, we can do it like we're used to spice and like no it was they were really nice but my god they killed them <laughs> for like a day. and after that after that i realized i can't be too cocky about my spice levels because <laughs> no matter how no matter how much spice you've had during your life there's could be something that always beats you as well yeah <laughs> um yeah so has anyone else wanted to share their um share their fast today and how um and, and what they're from down today um just put your hands up if you guys want to share what share what you want to talk about or you can if you feel better you can talk in the chat and i think we had some people talking um 
Saeed said it was blissful. So um, is there any particular reason why today was blissful? That something really good happened? Or was it just the fact it was a good day? Um, and Ryder also said that she's a big fan of Punjabi. Punjabi someone says, yeah, I like those ones as well. I remember I had once in Delhi, I think. Um, yeah, they're my favorite trial samosas and I had them. They're really good as well. Um, I, I think we can bring in Dr. Craig. So what, um, I don't know, have you ever had, for, have you ever had any sort of experience of fasting? Um, um, you've worked so much on inter, sort of inter-faith dialogue. I thought you maybe, maybe have you tried fasting one day or is it? Yeah, Rehan, um, actually fasting is a big part of my life, even outside of the kind of perceived religious obligations of it. Um, I actually enjoy fasting. Um, I think it helps reset ourselves in many ways, our minds and our bodies. And I actually feel like it's very therapeutic. And my wife actually tells me you have to not fast so much. And I'm talking year round. I'm not just talking during Lent or something like Ramadan. Um, so fasting is actually a big part of who I am. But in terms of its linkages to specific religious communities, I have indeed spent you know, certain days um, with particular Muslim communities during Ramadan in which I've engaged in, um, in the fast. And then of course the iftar. And I'll give you an example back in like 2008, I was uh, undertaking a study with professor Akbar Ahmed of American university. And this study brought us throughout the entirety of the United States. And we were studying what it meant to be an American through the lens of Muslims and we started our journey during Ramadan. So every single day we broke the fast with a different community, which was really remarkable. And that was really my first kind of intensive introduction uh, to, to fasting and to, into Ramadan. So, you know, I, um, I'm not fasting today, um, but I've fasted this week. And, uh, but again, it's not like I'm not breaking the fast at like sundown. It's just kind of, I'm doing it kind of on my own schedule. Uh, if that makes sense. Right. Oh, that's, oh, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Like, I remember, I think I've been reading quite a lot of the last few years about how, uh, not just in the Muslim community, but obviously in the non, in like some other communities talking about the benefits, the health of fasting. And I think things like the, I don't want to say what is the word, the virus or like the five two diet or the thing that seems to be they all kind of um, kind of going for the same thing. And I think it's quite interesting how um, fasting has become, as you said, not just a religious thing, but sort of more of a health benefit thing. And I think in Islam, there's a definite, I've read definitely bits about how um, the health benefits is also kind of contributes to why we fast as Muslims. But I think there's, there's yeah, different reasons as well. Yeah, definitely. And I, I in some ways you really can't disconnect, you know, the, the, the health and the religion, you know, religion is about health. It is about your life. It is about, it is about your well being. Um, so, and I saw a comment, someone was saying intermittent fasting, I guess. So I guess what I, what I do would be characterized, um, as, as such. And, uh, but I also say, uh, well, I, I would also note that, um, I don't think my fast would be as strict as the fast that is kind of what we see in the Islamic tradition. Like I would, I would drink water throughout the day, something like that, but I wouldn't necessarily eat food. Right. So I would not have breakfast. I would have no snacks, no lunch. And then at night I would have my, my big dinner uh, and then just, and then just fall asleep because I eat so much and then I'm lights out. Uh, so that's that's my that's like my general approach i think that definitely we can share that across in other communities definitely the, my experience of fasting throughout the years as well I've definitely been like oh no i ate so much at the end and i'm alive so um okay but quick before i let me just share the res share results of a pause and then we can take you directly on dr considine to your speech all right so quick share of the results that it seems that the fast so 29% of you said it was easy and 71% said it is okay, which is interesting. Um, but the good thing is no one said it was difficult, which is great news actually. Um, so it seems that everything with everything going on in the world, at least our fa at least the fasting is not adding to our stresses of the world. It's probably giving more benefits actually in the way. Oh. 
Um, and yeah, so without further ado, Dr. Craig, uh, it's up over to you. Thank you, Rehan. Um, and of course, to the Ramadan 10 Project and to the Islam Channel and the Arts Council of the UK. Um, thank you all so much for organizing this event. And I hope this finds you in good spirits and in peace. And I hope your Ramadan has been uh, going well thus far. And I wish you a continued kind of blessed and enriching and challenging journey because being challenged helps us improve and helps us sharpen our, our character and our conduct. And in terms of character and conduct, I will be speaking uh, for the next 15 minutes or so on uh, Prophet Muhammad's character and conduct. And for those that may not be familiar with my own identity, and I know Rehan gave a short introduction, but I am a, a Christian who in recent years has gained not only a respect, but a deep appreciation for Prophet Muhammad's life, his teachings, and also his legacy. And I find his legacy especially important because we can read about what he did. We can read about what he taught. But if you don't see people living those teachings and that example, it really doesn't become as meaningful. So for me over the years, you know, almost half my life now engaging in Christian Muslim relations and just engaging in peace building in general, it's been a true privilege for me in many ways to see the, his teachings live out in society by people who happen to identify themselves as Muslims and people who don't identify as Muslim. Uh, I am a Christian who finds a lot of worth in his teachings, especially on humanity, which is my main subject for today. And when we think about humanity, there's many ways of, of defining it. I think a, a certain set of key terms pop up into at least my head when I think about humanity, talking about things like um, universalism, uh, things like transcending tribalism, transcending these rigid identity categories that divide us as human beings. I think about uh, peace, and in recent months, actually, I've been thinking about Prophet Muhammad's humanity through the prism of a Hebrew concept, an actual Hebrew term that is linked to uh, the ancient Jewish scripture. And you may be familiar with it. It's tikkun olam. And tikkun olam is a term that literally translates to healing a fractured world healing a fractured world. So to heal a fractured world suggests that the world is, is broken. There's something going wrong in society that has brought hardship and pain and division to a given society. And if you dive back into the traditional Islamic sources, one would recognize that the environment that Prophet Muhammad was kind of reared in, not only in Mecca, but in the wider region, was a society that had a lot of friction and had division. And he becomes the figure, obviously in 610, when he starts receiving his revelations, he becomes the kind of torchbearer for a new vision of society, which not only focuses on repairing humanity, but simultaneously also focuses on embracing humanity, embracing our common humanity. There's a passage in the Quran, which I always find to be quite enlightening and inspiring. You know, essentially God is saying that we have broken you up into nations and tribes so that you can get to know one another. And I think this is very much the spirit in which Muhammad is operating. And when we look at a couple of sociological concepts that we see today that I like to apply back to 6th and 7th century Arabian society, uh, we see 
Arabian society steeped in this tribalism. And if you're familiar with tribalism, it often leads to racial divisions and racism. And although racism may not have been a concept that specifically existed back during Prophet Muhammad's lifetime, we do know that people were being treated differently based on their racial, uh, based on the perception of their race, right? So if you didn't look like the majority kind of Arab, take for example, Bilal ibn Rabbah, one of Prophet Muhammad's companions, like he looked differently. And we know that he was treated differently based on his appearance. And we know that Prophet Muhammad is coming with a, mes uh, with a message to his companions and to his followers and really to all of um, the, the wider community that focused on racial equality, that focused on appreciating people for the simple fact that they are human and that you didn't need any other requisites to be appreciated or to be valued. So the term that I like to use, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, it's anti-racism, right? So Prophet Muhammad was not merely someone who stood for racial equality or what we might refer to as non-racism. We also know that he was anti-racist in the sense that he was actively taking measures in society to heal society that had been driven by racism. And we have multiple examples in the traditional Islamic sources when Abu Dar um, al-Ghifari was in a conversation with Bilal and there was a confrontation and Abu Dar was saying things to Bilal, oh, like you're the son of a black woman, basically blaming his wrongdoing or his his, uh, his his actions based on the color of his skin. And Muhammad steps in and says, you know, this racialization that you're engaging in is part of jahiliya. It's part of the age of ignorance. And this is not part of the kind of new vision, this new vision of humanity that is linked to Islam that I am bringing. We also know that Prophet Muhammad, along with Abu Bakr, helped to free Bilal, literally helped to break the chains of the slavery but I think even more than that, Prophet Muhammad envisioned a humane society that not only allowed people to be free outside of the institution of something like slavery, but Muhammad created an environment and a society that allowed someone like Bilal to thrive, to be socially mobile, to excel, to rise in the um, the kind of hierarchy in many ways in the seventh century society. So Muhammad was coming and we saw too in the farewell sermon, right? To paraphrase an Arab has no superiority over non-Arab, white has no superiority over non-white and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so he's very much coming with a new message in terms of how we perceive one another and what we should do in light of a development like racialization. We also see that Muhammad comes to engage in tikkun ulam, to heal a fractured world, not necessarily at the micro sociological level, like standing up for Bilal and condemning racism when he sees it, but also in terms of politics and governance. We know that Meccan society, when Muhammad received his revelations, was Hyper tribal. It was it was divided amongst tribes and clans and families. And we also know that when he travels to and moves to Medina in 622, he was responsible for healing a generations long rift that had caused a lot of damage and conflict and bloodshed between the various tribes of Medina. They happened to be pagan and Jewish, and there was also a if you trust some of the scholars, a sizable Christian community as well. So if you can imagine Muhammad kind of moving to Medina at this time, and he's the mediator, he's the, the jurist and the judge, what does he do? He brings the tribes together. He has a council. 
he listens to them. He allows them to speak. He hears out their grievances. And then it comes time for him to actually create a political project that can fix the problem, to heal the fractured world. And Prophet Muhammad creates, along with the tribes of Medina, the constitution of Medina, which is really a revolutionary, groundbreaking document that was way ahead of its time. And the term that I like to use to describe it is that of a civic nation. So a civic nation is a nation in which literally all members of society, regardless of race, religion, culture, ethnicity, can belong. They have a place there. And what makes a civic nation unique is that it's the laws, it's the philosophy and the political principles that make someone fit. So freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, the right to own property, the right to participate in government, uh, governance. These were all features of the constitution of Medina. And I juxtapose this to that of a ethnic nation. An ethnic nation is one in which your sense of belonging is determined the moment you're born, right? So if you're part of the leading tribe or the leading race, you might be better off. Classic example is like the the Third Reich with Nazi Germany. Not only was white supremacy a feature, but there was like a certain element of white supremacy that you needed. So Muhammad is coming in and saying, okay, no more supremacy. Like what, what is gonna unite this fractured community is a set of political principles, which were neatly laid out in the constitution of uh, Medina. And I'd also say that Prophet Muhammad brought this new vision of humanity to the forefront through the prism of what I refer to as religious pluralism, which has been distinguished by top scholars such as Diana Eck of Harvard University as being different from being religiously tolerant. And if you think about kind of tolerating a loved one or a friend, there's something that kind of rubs you the wrong way about the thing is that you're tolerating, right? Like there's, you, d- you don't wanna get your, your hands messy. You don't wanna really grapple with it. There's something standoffish about tolerance. And I've argued in my scholarship that Muhammad engaged in pluralism, which is the energetic engagement with religious diversity, the energetic engagement with religious diversity. We see it in the constitution of Medina, bringing all of this diversity together into a political project, which is quite intensive. But we also see it in 630 or 631 towards the end of Muhammad's life when he visits, uh, when he allows the Christians of Nadran to visit Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina. And for three or four days, if you believe in the historical sources, the Christians of Nadran and the Muslims of Medina engaged in basically a diplomatic endeavor. They had different and they had different positions on the nature of Jesus. They engaged in a very intensive debate on Christology, but they did so while agreeing to disagree, which is really important, agreeing to disagree. They tolerated each other's views in this, in this context, which is good, but uh, they, they also, um, the Christians of Nadran did, they also had a time and space to pray inside of Prophet Muhammad's mosque, inside Masjid al-Nabawi in Medina, which for a lot of people, Muslims particularly, might be a kind of red line, like it might be seen as kind of impermissible or contrary to Islamic beliefs, which I respect, and I'm not trying to criticize that. But when I think about that event, I think first and foremost, what message was Prophet Muhammad trying to send to his guests? And I think the number one thing was to be hospitable, to treat your guests how you would want to be treated if you were in another, uh, another space. And we know too that during this period, around 630, 631, um, there was religious tension throughout the region. You know, Christians were fighting Zoroastrians and even among, 
amongst Christian communities, there was strife. We know in Medina, the pagans were fighting Jews and so on and so forth. So Muhammad is coming with this kind of, again, this new vision for humanity, all under the guise of healing. To heal this fractured world, what must be set in place for a society to move on and to kind of flourish? And to wrap it up, really, it's anti-racism, the promotion of racial equality, the importance of civic national principles in thinking about what kind of nation you want to belong to, and then the importance of pluralism, moving beyond mere tolerance of one another and kind of really getting to know one another at an authentic level, at a genuine level, which does not require us to all think the same way but it does require us to at least know where the other people are coming from and why they think the way that they do. So Tikkun Olam for me is inspiring. It's uh, one of the reasons why I'm passionate about being a Christian. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm passionate about, passionate about studying and talking about Prophet Muhammad and also uh, respecting his uh, legacy and more than that, appreciating his legacy. So I, I'll stop there. Um, it's about 15 minutes and uh, looking forward to a Q&A with y'all. Thank you, Dr. Constantine. That was really interesting. There's so much, like I often find out with these speakers, there's so much different questions I have to think of. And there's so many, like even in my head, I'm thinking of those questions, but obviously I'll let everyone else kind of join in. But before, um, there are a few questions coming up. Uh, but before I do, I think if you don't mind if I ask a question myself. Um, so you spoke a lot about anti-racism and sort of a lot of themes that kind of seem to resonate today in the modern world. Um, is there anything you think that from your studies that you've learned about the Prophet Muhammad um, and his life and the humanity that you feel that we can do, apply to the modern day that we aren't already doing so? Hmm. Well, I do think in some ways we are applying the kind of framework that I just um, outlined. We are and we, we aren't. Um, I think in recent years, like anti-racism, religious pluralism, civic national principles have received like more momentum and more steam, which is a good thing. But I feel like a lot of the times it's happening in the so-called Western world, which is, which is a good thing. And if I could, I guess, be kind of critical about uh, some Muslim majority countries around the world, like I, th I think there, there could be, and I think there is being more kind of work done to kind of reimagine Prophet Muhammad's vision. Um, so if I could be critical of countries around the world, I would, I would say that they could do a better job of implementing these, these principles. And one issue that I didn't talk about too is that of women's rights. You know, and when we talk about healing a, a fractured world in the sixth and seventh century, again, if you go back to the traditional sources, uh, they're quite clear that uh, women were not really, not, not even respected really during the, the time of the prophet Muhammad let alone respected. And we had pretty awful things happening, you know, with the, the lack of um, appreciation for, for life, for baby girls, women having few rights. And uh, Prophet Muhammad is, is coming with a, again, a, a new message that these people should be respected because they're great. They're talented. Um, they're, they're people that, not only can provide value to a relationship or a family, but they, they can provide value to the wider society. So, Rehan, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of touching upon your, your point in your question, but um, yeah, it's, it's tough to kind of, it's tough to measure, you know, how well are we doing in terms of holding these values up uh, how well are we doing in terms of following them? Um, I don't know how we all feel about that, but I think it's a little, a little good and a little bad. 
Yeah, no, you're right. I think, every, as Dr. Craig said, I think everyone else, uh, feel free to chime in on what you think and what the conversation is. Um, uh, but I think we have um, a question from Hawazin. Uh, Hawazin, do you want to bring in your question? Yes, thank you. First, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Uh, I think you can hear talking about the profit for hours. So, so <laughs> thanks a lot for this. Um, so I was wondering actually, because I'm following you on social media and um, I know a little bit of, about your work, et cetera. And I was wondering what bring you actually, what bring you to learn more about the prophet, PSP uh, Oppenheim. And after learning about him, did his, did your vision, your opinion change a lot? Uh, like, uh, what, yeah, how was it for you? And uh, third thing will be, um, do you think that people should know more about him actually like the, the, the wider uh, population not just Muslims but like d do we have to do a work to um, talk more about the Prophet Sarasim and, and, and all this all his amazing characteristics because he's very inspiring within the, 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 the Muslim community because we know about him but what about the others thank you Habazin. Um so my journey with all this stuff, not only just like Prophet Muhammad, but with Islam and with Christian Muslim relations, it really started because of my own ignorance. And I, I'm a, a product of the 9-11 the generation. Like I was 16 when 9-11 happened. And for those in the audience, if you remember who you were when you were 16, I feel like that's a very kind of fragile age in which like a lot of stuff is happening and like you could take a couple turns here and there that could be really good and that could also not be so good for you. And I grew up in an environment which had really no exposure to Muslims, mm -hmm. no exposure to Islam. I didn't know anything about Islam or Muslims. Um, when I got to college and I started interacting with scholars who happened to be Muslim, I realized that my brain and my heart and my soul had been corrupted by propaganda, by politicians, and I took it personally. I was actually offended that I had become something and I was thinking in ways that weren't really reflective of reality. So I became passionate about knowledge and the power of knowledge, not just knowledge in books and in academic articles and in newspapers, but the power of knowledge through human experience, and actually meeting with people, spending time with people, going to their communities and vice versa, hosting people. So that's what started this. And then in terms of Prophet Muhammad, it actually took me, man, like, about 10 years from the beginning of this mm -hmm. till about 2013, when I came across a book by John Andrew Morrow called The Covenants of the Prophet Muhammad with the Christians of uh, the World. And Dr. Morrow's book was published in, in 2013 or 14. And this was right when um, a group like ISIS was kind of running haywire around the Middle East and a lot of Christian communities were being attacked. And of course we had rampant Islamophobia in the West. So I, I read his book and I thought to myself, this is perfect. This set of documents that Prophet Muhammad had, uh, had produced and the treaties that he had entered with the Christians of his time can help Muslims yeah. kind of reimagine the place of Christians in a Muslim community, but it can also help Christians in the West see a different version of Prophet Muhammad that is not seen. So I took a lot of what Dr. Mora was doing and I tried to bring it into the mainstream mm -hmm. and I tried to make it applicable to uh, current affairs, modern day mm -hmm. events, because they, what use is scholarship if it's not relatable to what's happening to us today? So in many ways, my opinion didn't change of Prophet Muhammad. I just didn't have an opinion, really. I had a blatant kind of clean slate. And thankfully, I've had really good teachers that have guided me along the way. And then finally, Habazin, in terms of your last point, should more people learn about Prophet Muhammad? Absolutely. Uh, and, they, and they shouldn't 
necessarily embark upon a journey towards knowledge of his life with the hope of, you know, converting or changing yeah. religion. Just no, obje no. yeah, objectively look at this person's body of work, objectively look at what he did, mm -hmm. objectively look at how people today are inspired by him exactly. and just respect it and appreciate it and love it. And if you convert, great. That's, that's what works for you. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's also quite important. I'll end with this because we also know not only today, but throughout history, Prophet Muhammad has been defamed. He has been mischaracterized by people who are not Muslim. And it's really important for us to get these kind of fresh narratives out into the public so people can see different angles, not just a kind of theological or religious angle, but a sociological angle. I think that's helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I think I'm going to try to find the book that you say, because I was wondering if it was a book that actually gave you those like um, those ideas at the beginning. And yes, it was. So I'm going to look for the book. Thank you. Yes. Very. Yes, of course, Hosein. Thank, Thank you. you. It's quite interesting that you went on to that point because Iman had a good question talking about saying that we've touched on the humanity of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but unfortunately the general non-Muslim world have a rather negative opinion of him, which I believe you touched on a little bit. Um, and she asked, as someone that has gone through the journey of educating yourself, what would be your advice to dispel these negative notions people have about our Prophet? And I believe there's another question on that as well. So after this, we can go into that one as well. I would say um, spend time with actual human beings who are inspired by Prophet Muhammad and who try to embody his, his teachings in their everyday life and in society. Now, of course, some of you may say, well, you know, what if, you know, you go to someone who perceives Prophet Muhammad to be violent. I mean, these are the these are the minority voices. Um, I think the overwhelming majority of Muslims see Prophet Muhammad as someone who, again, engages in this tikkun olam, engages in this embrace of humanity. So when you when you hear people, when you spend time with people, when you sit at a table with people, you break bread together, you share food together, you share stories together, and you hear how people are motivated to make a change in their communities, not just their Muslim communities, just community at large, because this is who Prophet Muhammad was to them. I think that's very, very powerful. So it's about having kind of these authentic relationships and interactions with human beings instead of letting our screens dictate how we think about someone like Prophet Muhammad and Islam and Muslims and anything for that matter, Christians, Christianity, Judaism, and, and so on and so forth. So I very much believe it's like a top, uh, it's a bottom up approach. It's a very kind of grassroots approach. Spend time with people, engage with people, visit a cultural center, visit a masjid and see what actual people have to say rather than hearing what a pundit or a critic would have to say about Prophet Muhammad. I think that's very good advice. Um, I definitely agree. Um, and Tasadak had this sort of similar question. Um, I think maybe you saw more kind of direct at you personally, but uh, Tasadak, please correct if I'm wrong. Um, so how do you engage with conversation with non-Muslims specifically, um, especially when Islam isn't always portrayed in the best light. Um, like maybe you could, I, I think you've been doing it for a while, so maybe you can also talk about how it's changed over time. So one thing I've been stressing in recent years for individuals or communities that are seeking an interfaith interaction, let's say in this context between Christians and Muslims, I often say that the first three or four meetings you know, these encounters that you have with the so-called other should not even go anywhere near theology or religion. So leave the texts behind, leave the theological claims behind for the time being. And we can focus on things that humanize one another. So instead of looking at each other as Christians or Muslims, we find ways of looking at each other 
of course, as humans, but then even more specifically through different roles. You're a father, you're a mother, you're a son, a daughter, a brother, a sister, a colleague, a professional, a citizen of a country, uh, a person who belongs to a region of the world. So I think we kind of need to understand that to have these kind of critical conversations about interfaith or interfaith related issues, we can't just dive right into the, into the pit. You have to establish an atmosphere of, of trust, of camaraderie, where people are seeing you as a human rather than as part of a kind of identity category. Now, I'm also not saying that we should completely take religion out of all of this. The education with theology and texts, it should come later. That's what I'm saying. It should come later. You can't properly educate one another if you don't trust one another. And it's not easy to develop trust. So that's where I would start. Not with religion, with something other than religion, sports or food or whatever it might be. That's good. Um, I suppose, yeah, I think in the chat, everyone seems to really kind of go off on that question. It's fine that some people find a struggle to talk about Islam and their religion outside at work and West in different contexts. So I suppose hopefully that helps everyone sort of get a bit more expressive and sort of not um, sort of engage more with people. Um, so Sarah Hassan has um, has a thought and reflection as well. So if um, um, so, Sarah, do you do you want to go next about your question? I might have to un. un. Yes, thank you, Ryan, and um, this was a great uh, conversation. At, well, wh whatever you sh shared, Dr. Greg, and I also picked up how um, you're from the states and you're saying that. At some point, you know, if Europe was open, you'd be willing to move there. I was gonna say, I'm from Canada, uh, so we're neighbors. You and your family, if it gets too bad, we're we're we're, not, we're, we're right next door. Very good. <laughs> um, so yeah, I wanted to say how it's so interesting that you touched upon or you started your um, you know your speech with uh, with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because my husband and I were just having a similar reflection yesterday um, and. One thing I do is when I go over his um, hadith, right, like the prophetic statements he makes, I actually, because I'm kind of like an audiovisual learner, I visualize like how they were having the conversations. And I picked up that um, he, most of the time, it was always the person who came to ask that was being highlighted as the first like person to be, to be kind of like talking. And he was always on the listening end. And that was very, very, I thought it was very um, interesting because there's so much emphasis now on like the idea of listening, you know, whether it's in the business world or like in general, um, in workplaces. And I was like, that's amazing because if you look at his sort of his characteristics and personality, he was so good at that. And he was always the listening, like he was always the listener um, in, in all the conversations. And then he would never turn anyone away. Like he would either give them a solution or be like, you know, come back later. Um, I'll think about what, you know, what to say. Like, I'll, I'll have something, like he would think about it and he would get back to them. And that, that I thought was so, so amazing. And then to hear you start off today, your speech with, you know, just saying how you studied about him and, you know, you find him so inspiring was just resonated so well. <laughs> um, but awesome. on that note, I was gonna say like, it's true, like how you said, you know, you really want to start off with just humanizing the relationship and you want to touch on the similarities as much as possible and not really dive into the heavy sort of uh, the meaty discussions, you know, around um, religious uh, texts and ideologies. However, in reality, and also from my experience, I've seen at some point you do inevitably <laughs> come across those challenges. And it becomes a matter of trying to then advocate for your right in those situations. And that's when I find it's really hard to then stick to just similarities and, you know, not let emotions get in the way or have like, or get defensive or anything. How do you, or, you know, what would you suggest? Because, you know, you're a Christian. So from your perspective, how would you like 
a Muslim to approach you in those situations that would make you easy for you to kind of, you know, empathize or, or understand? Because I find that's when the conversations get very hard. Well, the second question, Sarah, you're, you're asking about really like how, how to encourage, let's say, a Christian to kind of empath, empath, uh, have some compassion for like you and your position. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So for example, mm. like I, I say, um, well, the prayer I've like, I've seen everyone's very accommodating here in Canada with the prayer, but then um, wait, like say there are certain religious festival that I'm not comfortable celebrating. And although I have utmost respect for the other religions, right? Like they want to do it. Some people don't take well to that. Um, but like, if I were to have that conversation with a Christian, what would be the best way to kind of get him to not be feel like like I mean, judgment feel, yeah. yeah exactly like i'm not making him feel inferior or anything it's just i'm trying to have my right and walk yeah. out peacefully <laughs> i honestly think sarah like your your two points of like the the kind of the the mannerisms of prophet muhammad and your second point are are tied together and i i think the best thing for you to do in these situations is to just be the example of Prophet Muhammad, who is someone who listens, who is respectful, is courteous, is someone who smiles, is someone who is willing to give advice, but is also someone who is willing to hold their ground. And I don't think you should necessarily walk into these conversations as saying, I need to like change this person's view of who I am. You know, like you don't answer to other people. I don't think you do at least, right? Like you, you answer to, to God. I'm guessing you do. I'm guessing you would believe in that, right? So like the, the, the best that you can do is to follow the example of Prophet Muhammad, of being kind, respectful, courteous, generous, compassionate. That's all you can do, really, you know, um, especially if, if you don't necessarily, uh, have multiple exchanges with a person, if it's a kind of one-off, the best you can do is to be the example, really. You know, I had a conversation once um, with Hamza Yusuf. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Hamza Yusuf um, at his, um, in Berkeley. And he gave me some insight that I'll never forget. And I forget what we were exactly talking about, but he said, he gave me a kind of binary of viewing the world. He said, like, we could look at the world horizontally and we could be very, very kind of uh, engulfed in things happening around us among people. And this is like perceptions and stereotypes and relations. And we could be so moved by this stuff, this noise happening around us that we become so kind of immersed in it that it's not good for us. Or we could think uh, vertically, you know, like we could think, okay, what happens here is important, but ultimately like my judge and the person that I'm really serving is our, the creator. And that's what really matters. And it's not your job to, to fix another person necessarily. All you can do is guide them and you can guide them through, the, through your example. So I hope that helps. And then I'd also like to say, with the kind of mannerisms of, of Prophet Muhammad and just like how he interacted with people. I think this is really, really important because, and a lot of people give me kind of flack for this because they say like, I'm trying to take theology out of Prophet Muhammad's life. I guess that might be true, but I don't necessarily think there's anything um, overly harmful about it. If we just look at how a person lives their life, how they treat other people, for all the reasons that you said, Sarah, and all the reasons that I just mentioned. One of my favorite is there are some reports that like Prophet Muhammad would never be the first person who wanted to let go of a handshake, right? So it's like, you ever, you ever had a handshake for like a really long time and you're like, this is so good. Like, I just, I don't, I don't want to be the person to, to take the hand away right? Because you're trying to show warmth. Like that's, that's who he, that's who he was like kind of fundamentally. And I, and I find that to be, to be quite inspiring. So Sarah, I hope that I provided you with a, at least a few things to, to get you thinking. 
Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, that's me. Um, so Dr. Constantine, I think we have about five minutes more before we have to start wrapping up. Um, I think is if there's any other questions and let me know otherwise I was going to ask um so what's your plan so in terms of academic and your research what are you sort of plan to focus on in the next year or so I think could be good yeah so I am in the very final stages here of my next book uh it's called people of the book prophet muhammad's encounters with christians and this book has a couple of aims. Number one, it's essentially a biography of his life told through the interactions that he had with Christians. So it follows the trajectory of his existence. It also looks at kind of sociological angles in these encounters. So I talked about some of these like religious pluralism, civic nation. One big one that comes out in this book that hasn't necessarily come out in previous books is the notion of allyship. And all of the examples in early Christian and Muslim history of Muslims supporting Christians and Christians supporting Muslims. In some of the most critical moments in, in the uh, history of the early Ummah. And then it also sheds light on who are these Christians? Like who was Waraka Ibn Nafal? Who was Bahira the monk? Who were the Christians of Nadran? What did they believe? So for me, it was fascinating to study this, uh, this subject. It actually taught me just as much about Christianity as it did about Prophet Muhammad and Islam. And I actually feel like it really sharpened my own Christian beliefs. Because some of you may be familiar, like I'm pretty unorthodox in my Christian beliefs. I am a Catholic. I identify as Catholic. I practice Catholicism. But I don't think the Trinity should be a requisite of Christian faith. When you go back into history and you realize how the Trinity became to be, it's quite controversial. And Islam addresses this, which is quite interesting. So this book is coming out on, it's supposed to come out in late May, if I can make my deadline, but it's actually being published by Hearst, which is based in, um, in London. What's the, Rehan, I hope you, you can help me here. It's, what's the, the part of London? I should know because I freaking live there, but um, it's, Blooms, Bloomsbury? Yeah. Like the, 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 yeah, Bloomsbury. So Hearst is based in Bloomsbury. So it's coming out in late May, but then it's being released in North America in early August by Oxford. Uh, so it's a bit, bit strange, but yeah, be on the lookout for that. And then finally, the, the book that I'll be writing this summer is tentatively called The Culture of Encounter, How Christians and Muslims Can Flourish Together. And I basically am looking at about 14 countries around the world in which there is Christian and Muslim tension. And I'm going back into history to basically explain how did we get here, but then also using history as an inspiration to provide solutions to some of these problems. So I'll be writing that book uh, this summer. And then at some point I need to take a break from, from writing books because um, it's exhausting, but, um, it's a blessing to, I guess, have this energy, but I also just want to read books. I want to read books too, not write books. So if y'all have any good recommendations for, for books, uh, please do shoot me a DM somewhere on social media. I think, uh, you can even do the chat. I think we've got well, we think it's on and say the times everyone can shoot any ideas they have. Um, but no, that sounds really interesting. I think um, as a histor as a historian gra history graduate, um, I think about reading my history to learn about and apply it to the future is definitely it was actually kind of what I put in when I was applying for universities. So I think um, definitely that's a good interesting point. Um, and I think we've literally we have to start wrapping up right now. So. Um, so there's on about 28 or five. So we've got about five minutes. Um, but before we wrap up, I just need to, I just like to um, say thank you to Dr. Considine. Thank you very much for your talk. I think you've touched on a lot of very interesting issues. And I think it seemed to 
the theme it seemed to really resonate with people about how they in particularly um, how they engage with people of different faiths and I think um, the Muslims on who are joining us I think definitely resonated how they sort of explain their faith and engage with people outside I think particularly in the western world but I guess if most also probably in the non in Muslim majority countries as well I'm sure there's a lot of interfaith sort of dialogue there as well um but it's been a pleasure to have you with us it's been a pleasure to have everyone else with us um and before in the last few minutes before the Azan, um I wanted to say thank you again to our media partner Islam channel and the Arts Council UK for making this event possible uh, don't forget to get your exciting my open iftar pack and check out all our work at ramadantemproject.com there's not just the open iftar uh, that we're going uh when i first joined the organization started volunteering back in 2014 it was i think it started off that but we've exploded so much there's so much going on um and you just have to look at the website to figure it out um and read more about how we are fighting world hunger with islamic relief at iiu.co or slash rtp um and most importantly, Ramadan is a month of charity and giving. So we wanted to tell you about Launch Goods Ramadan Challenge. Uh, with the Ramadan Challenge, you can automate your giving to support different projects around the world, setting up a donation amount to give to different campaigns daily throughout the month. Um, and I know this is also a time when many of our Muslims give their zakat. So this is one of the perfect opportunities to give some uh, to donate. Um, and for everyone who signs up to the Ramadan Challenge using our link, uh, the Ramadan Time Project will be given a top up of $50 from LaunchGood. Um, and you can sign up at uh, launchgood.com forward slash team RTP. Um, so I think we have, have a couple of minutes before the Azan. Um, feel for, everyone in the chat, feel free to share what maybe what they're having for Iftar. Um, and I think the chat is actually exploding quite a bit as well. Um, yeah, so there's loads, and there's the links. Sarah has posted the links in the chat um, on the launch good. Um, so I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, so there's loads of chats. Uh, that's great, cool. Is there any mm, Arab? So Sarah said about Arab Brian and Cubs here, uh, which is uh, who else is having something interesting? I've, I find it also over here that I learn a lot about different other foods. Like I grew up very sort of Asian Indian centric cuisine, but definitely through Ramzan 10, I've learned a lot about Turkish cuisine, which is very interesting to me and loads of different other. Um, and there's other thank yous. Uh, thank yous coming in for you, Dr. Considine. Um, I love fish, Sarah says. Um, what kind of fish? I'm actually making fish right now for Thari. So um, what kind of fish is are you making? All, all kinds, cool. Um, Anyone, anyone uh, having pasta? I'm happy to host anyone if you want some amazing Italian dishes. I love to cook. Uh, I learned through my mom and my grandma. I'm an expert at pasta, says Sarah. <laughs> yeah, I'm making, uh, so yeah, I'm making pasta tonight. It'll be really good. All fresh ingredients. Um, yeah, keeping it real. Nice. Um, and I think we've got about time. So uh, we're just, we're going to have a moment of silent reflection right before uh, the design, and then we'll go straight to streaming the design. Thank you very much again for joining us. And thank you very much again, Dr. Constantine, for your talk. Thank you. اللهم إني لك صمت وبك آمنت وعلى رزقك أفطرت ذهب الظمأ وبتلت العروق وثبت الأجر إن شاء الله الله
اکبر اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اشہد اللہ اشہد اللہ الہ الا اللہ اشہد ان محمد الرسول اشہد ان محمد الرسول اللہ حی علی الصلاة Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy it. Um, see you tomorrow, hopefully. Inshallah.